Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome again to Lahem Panim. It's good to have you with us today as we continue our study of the book of Acts. We've been in chapter 8, which of course tells of how Philip brought the gospel into the region of Samaria. And a great many Samaritans have actually come to faith in Jesus Christ. And after that, Peter and John, they come in order to open the door for these Samaritans to receive the Holy Spirit. And afterwards, it says, after they, meaning Peter and John, had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now, this is a crucial turning point in the book of Acts because it's here that we begin to see the message of the gospel breaking out from being just a Jewish reality to being a message for everyone. God is starting to remind his people of something that they had forgotten, and that is that his salvation is for a whole world. Some time ago, I read of a preacher who, shall we say, was humor-inspired. And he attended a conference to help encourage and better equip pastors for their ministry. And among the speakers were many well-known and dynamic preachers. And one such preacher, he boldly approached the pulpit. He gathered the entire crowd's attention. And he said, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of a woman that wasn't my wife. And the crowd was shocked. And he followed up by saying, and that woman was my mother. And the crowd, of course, burst into laughter. And he delivered the rest of his speech, which went quite well. Well, the next week, this pastor, he decided that he'd give this humor thing a try in front of his own congregation. And he used that joke in his sermon. And so as he approached the pulpit that sunny Sunday morning, he tried to rehearse this joke in his head. But he suddenly seemed to be a little bit foggy on some of the details. And getting to the microphone, he said loudly, The greatest years of my life were spent in the arms of another woman that was not my wife. And the congregation inhaled half the air in the room. And he began to get excited. But in his excitement, he found that when it came time to deliver the punchline, he couldn't remember it. And so after standing there for about 10 seconds in stunned silence, trying to recall the second half of the joke, he finally blurted out, and I can't remember for the life of me who she was. Now, forgetting things can sometimes be very painful. But we, I think, are prone to forgetting things, especially when it comes to forgetting things about the Christian faith. And one of the basic things that we forget, or perhaps we just choose to ignore, maybe because we don't recognize the importance of it, is the place of Israel in God's overall plan in bringing redemption to the world. Especially we in our Western culture, we forget that God had always intended Israel to be a light to the nations. All the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God had told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And, you know, he repeats that command to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, immediately following the flood. And later, when God enters into covenant with Abraham, he makes a promise to him saying in Genesis 12, 3, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so we see that when God established Israel, they were to be a light to the nations. God says in Isaiah 42, 6, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. In Isaiah 49, 6, he says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Isaiah 
The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3, And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 8. It says, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, first of all, notice how Jesus' claim to be the light connects back to the concept of salvation given in Isaiah. It's very important to understand that Jesus saw himself as the embodiment, literally, of God's salvation that God had always planned on giving to the world through Israel. Now, that must have sounded a little bit jarring to those who heard Jesus, because notice Jesus doesn't say, I am the light of Israel. That's what his Jewish audience would have expected him to say. But no, he was speaking to them in the spirit of Isaiah, pointing them back to the reality that they had forgotten, which was that God's salvation is for a whole world. And so he says, I am the light of the world. Even in his conversation with Nicodemus, he had begun to hammer this point. What did he say to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 16? For God so loved the world. Another all-inclusive statement. And this is so important because the early church saw Jesus as the fulfillment of these passages in Isaiah. And therefore, they took these passages as their own personal commission. When Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch in Pisidia, it says the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and it began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles." For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. You see, God's plan has always been for Israel to be the means through which his salvation would be brought to the world. And though God had made a covenant with Abraham and with his people to bless them, the blessing was never meant for them alone. No, they were to channel that blessing to the world. Now, the sad reality that we're confronted with is that Israel failed to live out this call. And instead, they gravitated towards either of two extremes. The first was that Israel gave in to kind of a separatistic nationalism in which they resisted contact with all the surrounding Gentile nations. And we see this attitude very much alive in the person of Jonah. He was commanded by God directly to preach to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. But not wanting them to experience God's salvation— He took off in the opposite direction, and God had to use some mighty big circumstances in order to turn him around. Now, we know that Assyria had caused Israel a ton of grief, and they were a very wicked empire. But the nationalistic attitude of Israel during that time had all but completely cut them off from engaging in God's mission to reach the world. And unfortunately, that attitude, it pervaded much of Israel's history. And the second extreme was that of compromise. Israel, they were called to influence the surrounding nations to God. However, what ended up happening was that Israel, they became influenced by the surrounding nations. 
They were seduced by all the paganism, all the idolatry. And so they allowed themselves to become tainted by that spiritual adultery. And because they were tainted by that sin, by that false religion, they didn't have anything that they could give to the surrounding nations. They had become the very thing that they were supposed to fight against. Now, God was able to cleanse Israel of their idolatry, which we see he does through the Babylonian exile, after which Israel never returned again to their idolatry. But they did embrace a new kind of idolatry, and that was that they allowed their religion to become corrupted into a system of salvation by works. The temple itself became an idol. The religious rites, the sacrifices, they became idols as well. So much so that when God himself visited his temple in the New Testament, they didn't even recognize him. And they even hated many of the people that Jesus came to save. But all of that changed with the birth of the Christian church. As each new stage of growth, it pushes the church farther out in its scope. And what I want you to see is that the church has now become God's new instrument to further the work that he had always intended for Israel. They are his great new means of reaching the world. And while Israel had, up until this time, been very nationalistic in its focus, we find that the church would be an entity that would embrace people of every race, every culture, every nation. But as we've said before, this happened in stages. At Pentecost, the spread of Christianity began first in Jerusalem to an exclusively Jewish body. But it wasn't long after that that the church soon began to reach out to minister to the half-breed Samaritans, as they were called. And then in our passage next week, we find the third great milestone of the church, as the gospel finally begins to reach a Gentile audience as well, as through the ministry of Philip, a high official in the court of the Ethiopian queen comes to faith in Jesus Christ. But not only him, but we'll see also that through him, the gospel would eventually reach those in the great African continent as well. But what we need to be careful of is to keep Israel's problem from becoming our problem. Are you and I thinking globally? Are we fulfilling God's call to carry the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth? Oswald J. Smith, he has rightly pointed out that any church that is not seriously involved in helping to fulfill the Great Commission, has forfeited its biblical right to exist. Wow, pretty powerful. But you know, in light of that, every pun intended, let us not forget our central purpose, and that is to join Christ in the work that he's doing in the world. Let's join him this week. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word, and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.